Okay, I'll get started by just officially welcoming all of you. Sawadee Kap, welcome to Wat Tung Yu. Today is a third day of a course that we've been having here, but on Sunday, Wednesday, and Saturday, these are our days that we have regular classes here where students can come learn and come in to meditate and learn teachings of the Buddha. And what we do when I'm teaching these courses and retreats is the people who are coming in on Wednesday, you just come on in and join because we're going to be doing meditation in our courses anyway. And you guys are welcome to learn with meditation. You're welcome to stick after, stay around afterwards for the teaching that I share, which today is going to be the three poisons. This is the three individual problems that the Buddha discovered about the unenlightened mind. And I'm going to be sharing with you what these three uh, challenges are in the mind and then how to actually eliminate them to move the mind to this enlightened mental state. The enlightened mind is peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. It no longer experiences any anger, sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, boredom, loneliness, shyness, resentment, jealousy. Even the slightest displeasure is eliminated from the enlightened mind, where the mind can just be peaceful and joyful all the time. Where in the unenlightened state, the mind might have a tendency to be grumpy or irritable or agitated or angry or sad or these other discontent feelings. So by training your mind on the path to enlightenment, you can uproot and eliminate the pollutions in the mind that are causing it to experience these discontent feelings. So the teachings of the Buddha, they're designed for you to learn them to then reflect on them, to independently verify them, and then to practice them in order to train the mind and uproot the pollutions out of the mind. There's nothing in the teachings of the Buddha that you believe. You should never believe the teachings. It's not believe, 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 and then hope something good happens when you die. Instead, you're learning now, you're reflecting on the teachings now to independently verify them, and then you're practicing the teachings now and seeing the results now in this life. Because you know the situations where you usually get angry or frustrated or irritated, and as you're training your mind, you can see that those things don't occur anymore. That situations where you once got frustrated or irritable, those same situations can occur as you're training your mind. And you can see that the mind is peaceful and joyful in those same situations. So it starts with training the mind in understanding the teachings of the Buddha through learning, reflecting to independently verify and practice. In this way, you can get to wisdom and you can see the truth in the teachings of the Buddha. So I'd like to welcome all of you to our class, whether you're here at the temple or you're joining online. Welcome to all of you guys. We start our class with a meditation. The meditation that I'm going to start with is called breathing mindfulness meditation. This is the primary form of meditation that the Buddha taught in order to train the mind to enlightenment. You would need a lot more than just meditation in order to train your mind to enlightenment. You can't just meditate your way to enlightenment. There's more than just meditation, but you wouldn't be able to get to enlightenment without meditation either. So you'll need meditation. So we start with meditation as a way to train our mind. We'll start with some chanting to ease into the meditation and those of you guys that are here I see somebody passed out the laminated sheets that are on the table these are the Pali chants that we do the original teachings of the Buddha are in the Pali language so we still chant in the Pali language during the lifetime of the Buddha, everything he taught was oral and he didn't write anything down during his lifetime because the technology didn't yet exist in that region of the world where he was to be able to write things down. It wasn't until after he died that they wrote things down. So this Pali language is the original source of the teachings of the Buddha. I suspect that these chants were not even created by the Buddha. They were probably created by his students, either during his life or afterwards. During the lifetime of the Buddha, they used the chanting in order to commit the teachings to memory because he taught orally. So once every two weeks, they would chant in order to commit the teachings to memory so that then they could apply the teachings in daily life and actually practice them. Today, we have books and podcasts and YouTube videos and things like this. We don't need to uh, chant in order to remember the teachings. You can see the English translation translations there, that it's paying respect to the Buddha, the teachings, the community that you're part of. And that's why I suggest that the Buddha didn't even create these because he wouldn't create chants and have his students chant things to respect him. 
he would just respect people and have gratitude and appreciation for them. And then as a result, people would respect him. He wouldn't go around demanding for people to respect him. It w- he would just give respect and, and treat people polite, kind, friendly, and respectful. And then because he was so polite, kind, friendly, and respectful, people would be that way with him as well. But we use these chants to ease into meditation. These aren't any rites or rituals or ceremony or worship. It's not prayer or anything like that. It's just helping you to gain awareness of your mind, awareness of the breath, and gain more benefit out of the meditation itself. Then after the chanting, we'll all be meditating together. I'll be providing a bit of guidance at the very beginning. You'll hear me kind of talking and kind of guiding you in how to actually meditate in the way that the Buddha taught. And then there'll be a period of quietness where we'll all just be meditating together. And then we'll come out of the meditation with some more chanting. And then I'll open up to any questions that you guys have as you're developing your meditation practice. You might have questions about your meditation practice. So you're welcome to ask any and all questions. As you decide to ask questions, if you wouldn't mind just using a microphone so that people online can hear. And for those of you guys that are online, you can ask questions by putting it into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom and I'll be able to see that and answer your question. And if you're in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and ask any question you like directly. So if you guys would like to go ahead and join for meditation with you sitting on the floor or in a chair, whatever is comfortable for you, there's actually four positions that the Buddha uh, taught, seated, lying, standing, and walking. If you're on the floor, you might just sit with your legs lightly crossed. Some people like to have cushions under their rear and get their hips up in the air because if your hips are up in the air, it reduces the angle at your hips, your knees, and your ankles, and you get more circulation going in the lower body because you're not interested in being painful. If you ever experience any pain during meditation, you should adjust your position. The hands and the arms, the Buddha put his right hand over his left with his thumbs together, and he put this into his lap. But not everybody needs to do it exactly the same way. It's not possible because everybody's going to find something slightly different that's comfortable. So there's other options as well. Some people like to put their palms on their thighs or their knees or their palms up. It's whatever is comfortable for you. Even if you need a chair, you're welcome to get a chair and meditate in a chair because In a chair, some people can feel more comfortable in their lower body. So it's up to you. You would like the body to be comfortable, not luxurious and not painful, but in the, excuse me, in the middle where it's comfortable. The upper body should be erect. By keeping the upper body erect, this keeps the mind attentive and alert during the meditation. Whereas if you were slouched, the mind would have a tendency to be complacent and inactive. Or if you were real rigid, the mind would have a tendency to be overactive or uptight. So you would like to have the upper body erect where the mind can be attentive and alert during the meditation rather than complacent or overactive and uptight. So as we chant, I usually just put my hands together, but it's up to you how you would like to do this. You don't need to chant. Uh, You can just listen and follow along. But if you'd like to chant, you're welcome to. And then afterwards, I'll provide you some guidance in uh, meditation. Arahang Samma Samoto Makewa Poetang Makewan Hang Apiwa Tayami Savakato Makewatamu Damang Namasami Supatipano Makewato Savakasanko Sanghang Namami Napmara Sabhakavato Arato Sama Samputasa 
นับมวยรสภาคือว่าตัอารตุสมาสพุตสานับมวยรสภาคือว่าตัอารตุสมาสพุตสาอิติปิสุมหาคือว่าอารหังสมาสมุตุวิชาจารณังสมุโนสกัตโรกาวิตุอนุเตโรปุริสานามาสติสัตตาตาวามนุสนังโอตุปะคะวะตีโอเค with the lower body and the hands and arms comfortable in the upper body erect just close the eyes And start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. Here, you're just looking to establish the breath. A nice, natural, gradual inhale through the nose, and then whenever you're ready, exhale out through the nose. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. Your breath isn't going to necessarily match up with the guidance that I provide, and that's okay. This is your practice. So wherever you get to the next inhale, just breathe in gradually through the nose, experiencing the entire breath, developing a nice, natural, consistent, steady breath, not forced or controlled. Just a gradual inhale through the nose, experiencing the full breath, and then whenever you're ready, exhale out through the nose, breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. With the breath well established, start fixating the mind on the breath. Either the sound of the breath coming into the nose, or the sensation of air moving over the skin into the nose. The breath is the present moment. Fixate the mind on the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. In out,
Breathing in. And out. With the mind fixated on the breath, whenever you notice that it moves off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. No need to observe the thought, label it, judge it, analyze it, or even try to figure out where it's coming from. Just wherever you notice that the mind is moved off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. I'm going to be quiet now and let you do this work of focusing on the breath, cutting off and letting go any time the mind moves off the breath. You have nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. No one needs you right now. This is your time to focus on the breath. Breathing in and out.
What I'm going to do is just open up to any questions that you guys might have about meditation itself before we go into teaching today's topic. If there's anything you would like to ask questions about, you're welcome to ask questions about, whether it's meditation or anything else, because I know some of you guys are coming for maybe the first time to learn, and maybe you've never even learned the teachings of the Buddha before. This might be the first time you've been in a setting where You've had the opportunity to ask questions about Buddhist teachings, whether it's about the temples here in Chiang Mai or anything that you're seeing with Buddhism in the world. You're welcome to ask any and all questions. Just raise your hand, and those of you guys that are here, you're welcome to get the microphone over there in the middle of the bowl. And then those of you guys online, you can put your questions into the comment section of Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom electronically, and I'll be able to see that you have a question and call on you. Yes, ma'am, if you could get the microphone, please. And you guys can keep those with you, so you can just pass them around as you have questions throughout the morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, uh, so while meditating, so I, sh I, I should focus about uh, only breathing in and out, or I even uh, it should be very natural, um, like. Usually, so when we breathe in out, so we don't we don't care or um, it's it happens naturally. But uh, when we meditating, um, so we should focus only breathing or not. In this meditation of breathing mindfulness meditation, you're focused only on the breath. 
that you focus the mind on the breath and then whenever it moves off the breath, you cut it off and let it go and bring the mind back to the breath. Your goal in this meditation isn't to eliminate thoughts. Sometimes based on the instruction and guidance, people think that the goal is to eliminate your thoughts, but you can't eliminate your thoughts. As long as you're alive, you're going to have thoughts. So what you're doing is you're focusing on the breath because by focusing on the breath, you're bringing your mind into the present moment because it's going to tend to be interested to be in the past or in the future. And you're bringing it back to the present moment, which is the breath. And you're developing a mindfulness or awareness of mind. You're developing concentration, being able to focus on a single object like the breath. And you're gaining this discipline and control of the mind that whenever it moves off the breath, you can bring it back and bring it back and bring it back. So if 20, 30 different times during your meditation, you had to cut off a thought and bring it back to the breath, this is really good. This is really beneficial for your mind because your mind's going to want to hold on to things. This is the primary reason why the mind's getting angry and sad and frustrated is you see something that you don't like and your mind can't let it go. You just hold on to it and hold on to it. So you're trying to train the mind to easily let go and bring the mind back to the breath. Sometimes during meditation, when someone's first starting, they have a bombardment of thoughts, like rapid thoughts. This is normal when you're first starting to meditate. Or you'll have a thought and then you'll indulge in that thought and follow it for a period of time. And when then you'll notice kind of two or three minutes in that, ah, I'm meditating, let me bring my mind back to the breath. So if you're noticing any of these kinds of things, this is completely normal. As you train your mind more and more, you'll notice a quieting of the mind and a stillness of the mind. But even an enlightened being is going to have an occasional thought during meditation. But they're going to notice it right away and they're going to be able to easily cut it off, let it go and bring the mind back to the breath. So yes, you're always focusing on the breath with the understanding that it is going to move off the breath from time to time. And you'd like to notice it sooner and sooner and cut it off easier and easier and bring the mind back to the breath. And this is building qualities of mind that you can then practice in daily life. That now in daily life, you'll have more mindfulness, more awareness of mind. You'll have more concentration in your daily life and you'll be able to cut things off and let it go. In daily life, you're cutting off only the unwholesome thoughts. When you have a wholesome thought in daily life, do it, right? If you think about, hey, I'd like to take my friend out to lunch today, or I'd like to call my mom and see how she's doing, go for it. That's a wholesome thing. In meditation, we're cutting off everything because we're just training our mind to easily let go. It's like exercising the mind. But in daily life, you're only cutting off the unwholesome thoughts. It's just like a professional athlete that they'll train in one way and then they'll perform their sport in a different way. So if I'm a pole vaulter, I might do weight training, cardiovascular training, agility training, but then my sport is pole vaulting. So it's the same thing as you're exercising the mind in meditation to develop mindfulness, awareness of mind, concentration, be able to focus on a single object, be able to easily let go and bring the mind back to the breath. And then in daily life, you're just cutting off the unwholesome thoughts when they arise. Can you put the mic up to, can you put your <laughs> video? <laughs> uh, to the breath, uh, focusing breath. So for example, so I am a beginner and then so when, so for, for example, so it just, it's my way, mm -hmm. the first breath, breath in, and then so when it, something, some thought coming in my mind, and then, so I try to eliminate and buy, and then so I uh, breathe out, mm -hmm. and then so, and then so, um, next, um, so a new breeze come in, and if it's uh, so still, uh, if I, I have uh, some thought, and then so I say goodbye, and then so breathe out. Do, do you think it's a good way? You would like to build up the ability to internally cut off whatever thought is there. That's what you would like to ultimately be able to do so that then in daily life, your mind doesn't have to think about something else in order to cut off a thought. But if that's where you are in your practice, you're just developing your practice. I know at least for a good three to six months, maybe people while they're in meditation and a thought comes up, they have a hard time letting it go. So they need to tell the mind, let it go, let it go. And then boom, they kick it out. And now they're on the breath for a minute or two or three and then the mind moves off the breath again. So 
if you need that as you're getting going, feel free to use it. But what you would ultimately like to get to is that you can just internally cut it off without needing that. But as you need it, go for it and use it. Because in daily life, even though you're starting to meditate, you don't yet have the ability to internally cut off these, these thoughts. So even in daily life, when you're having an unwholesome thought, you might need to tell your mind, let it go, just let it go. But over time, you'll develop the ability to internally cut it off without even having that kind of thought come up or that, that need. But as you need it, go for it. And then more and more as the mind gets comfortable letting things go and it has that ability, then you won't need it anymore. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Okay, I have some questions here coming in online. Let me read them and then I'll um, answer them here. Let's see. We just started live streaming about a week and a half ago. So I'm going to have to bring the mic over here so that we can read this. Let's see. This is my first time learning about Buddhism, and I would like to know exactly where it began. This is my first time in this class. What book are you currently teaching from? Uh, it's 9.34 p.m. Tuesday night here in Peru. Is it already Wednesday in Thailand? Also, if you can explain the different classes, please. Sure, Jose. So. Your first question here is, this is my first time learning about Buddhism, and I would like to know exactly where it began. This is my first time in the class. What book are you currently using? So Buddhism began with Siddhartha Gautama in the region. Sorry, let me just put this on first. So Buddhism began in uh, where a region of the world that we consider to be Nepal or Northeast India, during that time, those lines weren't there. Those countries weren't established yet. So it began over 2,500 years ago with Siddhartha Gautama. He was a prince. And he stepped down away from the royal family to uh, be a roaming aesthetic where he basically gave up all his worldly possessions in order to seek this better way of life and understand how to train the mind to get to enlightenment. And he eventually got to enlightenment on his own at the age of 35. He spends 45 years sharing his teachings. Countless people get to enlightenment during his lifetime, and they know they get to enlightenment because the condition of your mind is improved. If you go one year, two years, three years, you haven't experienced any anger, any frustration, any annoyance, not even the slightest bad mood, you'll know that your mind is enlightened. So for 45 years, he taught dying at the age of 80, and countless people get to enlightenment during his lifetime. And then his teachings are preserved in such a way that countless more people get to enlightenment after his death. These are the three primary criteria that make a Buddha a Buddha, is that they get to enlightenment by themselves without any teachers or any guides. They independently discover the teachings. They then dedicate the rest of their life to sharing their independently discovered teachings with countless individuals who actually get to enlightenment during that person's lifetime. Then they preserve their teachings in such a way that countless more people get to enlightenment after their death. These are the three primary criteria that make a Buddha a Buddha. The book that I use I, for this group learning program on Sunday and Wednesday is the Words of the Buddha, The Path to Enlightenment, Revealing the Hidden. This is part of the book series. That's the name of the book series. Volume one is titled Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Enlightenment. And this is the book that I use for the Sunday and Wednesday classes. You can download it for free from our website, which is buddhadailywisdom.com. Or you can take that file and go print it, or you can get printed copies here at the temple or on Amazon. If you have access to Amazon anywhere in the world, it's on Amazon. And this is a foundational text that over the course of seven months, I go chapter by chapter by chapter to help students to learn and understand the foundational teachings of the Buddha. Then the other books of the series, volumes two through 13, these are part of another program that I teach on Saturdays. It's called the Pali Canon and English Study Group. All of these books are based on the original words of the Buddha. The words of the Buddha are captured in 45 volumes of books. They're about this thick, about, what is that? About 10 centimeters, six inches or so, four inches or so. Um, 
and it would be very exhausting to read all of them. It would probably take a person a good 10 years to read all of those. But this book series consolidates it into a digestible content that you can read over a period of time and you can get help from a teacher to be able to learn and practice. So Jose, if you would like to learn, you're welcome to join at this time on Sunday, Wednesday, in or Saturday at 9 a.m., 9 p.m. Thai time. So as you see, it's Tuesday evening where you're at, but here it's already Wednesday morning. We're living in the future. <laughs> so you can you can attend either here uh, when we uh, live stream from the temple or if you would like to join in the evenings because I teach the same class in the evening from my home, which would be Wednesday morning for you. So it would be Sunday, Wednesday or Saturday morning for you. And you can find out more information on the classes on our website. If you go to BuddhaDailyWisdom.com, there's a, a page for online learning and you'll see all the different classes and programs there. And then there's the in-person classes that you'll see on uh, the web page as well. Okay, that looks like all the questions coming in online and also here at the temple. So why don't we go ahead and move forward with today's topic, which is the three poisons, craving, anger, and ignorance. This is where you're going to learn about the three high level problems in the unenlightened mind that the Buddha discovered and why the mind is experiencing discontent feelings like anger, sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, boredom, loneliness, shyness, resentment, jealousy. By you understanding what the problem is, then you can actually implement the solutions and actually fix it. There's a whole path to enlightenment that you would need to learn. And part of that path is to understand the individual problems. If you've learned the teachings of the Buddha here with me, then you've learned the Four Noble Truths. Those of you guys that are in the course, we studied that yesterday, which is kind of the first window into understanding the unenlightened mind. And you understand in four simple statements, the problem, the cause of the problem, the elimination of the problem and the path forward. You learn about things like the mind craving permanence, where it wants things to be permanent, but yet everything in the world around us is impermanent and you learn about craving desire attachment the longing the yearning the mind chasing after the objects of its affection and it can only experience happiness if certain conditions are met and then when the unenlightened mind is basing its inner feelings on some condition then that condition changes and now when the condition changes your mind ends up with frustration or sadness or some other discontent feeling so for example if you wake up in the morning and you see that it's sunny outside you might get happy and excited because you can go outside and go hiking or go play outside you get so excited because it's sunny outside and then we go take a shower in the unenlightened state and we come out and we see that it's raining and now you might be frustrated or irritated well if you base your inner feelings on the condition of something like the sun the sun is impermanent so therefore your happiness is impermanent it's only a matter of time before that condition changes and now your mind's going to move to sadness frustration or other discontent feelings so as long as the mind is creating these conditioned feelings these conditioned feelings are going to arise they're going to change and they're going to fade away this is why your happiness at this point is not permanent because you're experiencing conditioned feelings. You're basing your inner feelings on some impermanent condition. If my mom calls me today, I'll be happy. Or if I get that new job, I'll be happy. Or if my friend calls me, I'll be happy. Or if my bank account is this, I will be happy, right? But if you base your inner feelings on these conditions, then when those conditions change, your mind's going to move to sadness, anger, frustration, or others. So this is what you kind of learn. And there's detailed teaching that I go through in the Four Noble Truths to show you how the mind is experiencing these discontent feelings. We essentially will attribute our anger and frustration to other people. We will tend to blame other people for our discontent feelings. We will say, you are making me angry, or you are frustrating me, or you are annoying me. This is what the unenlightened mind thinks. It's a misunderstanding. It's a misperception. It's a false belief. But when you study the teachings of the Buddha and you independently verify the teachings, you can see the truth for yourself that your mind is causing its own anger. 
it's causing its own frustration. When you get annoyed, your mind is causing it itself. You may not see that right now, but the more you study the teachings of the Buddha and you independently verify them, you can see that your mind is causing its own discontent feelings. So you learn about this in what's called the Four Noble Truths. This is the very first teaching of the Buddha. And then he layers in more detailed teachings like the three poisons. And then you go deeper and you start looking at more of the problems in the mind. And then there's a layer even deeper than this called the 10 fetters, where you can go in and see the individual pollutions that the Buddha discovered and how to actually eradicate them. So this morning, I'm going to be sharing with you the three poisons, or we also refer to them as the three unwholesome roots or the three fires. Let's see. These poisons are essentially... Uh, defilements. We call them pollutions or we call them taints. Uh, This is what's plaguing the mind. This is what's keeping it in the unenlightened state. And as long as you're unaware of these poisons, then they're going to continue in the mind. And then you're going to continue to have certain struggles and certain difficulties in the world. But if you can understand what these problems are and then the solutions, you can eradicate it and get to a point where your mind's peaceful and joyful. So these are the defilements. They're a high-level description of the unenlightened mind. We refer to them as either the three poisons, the three unwholesome roots, or the three fires, also known as the taints or pollutions of mind. They explain why the mind is in the unenlightened state and through making decisions through craving anger and ignorance, this is where one will experience unwholesome results. Because when you understand what the three poisons are, whenever you're making decisions through these, it's going to create an unfortunate situation in the world where now unwholesome results come back to you. But if you're unaware of these poisonous states of mind, you'll continue to make decisions through these three poisons and then unwholesome results will come back to you. So it explains clearly the description of the problems in the unenlightened mind, where it's the 10 fetters that really explain the more detail. So ultimately, on your journey to enlightenment, you would need to learn what's called the 10 fetters. But here, the way that the Buddha teaches is it's a layering effect. So that's why yesterday I taught the 10, I'm sorry, yesterday I taught the four noble truths. That's the first layer. And then the next layer is understanding the three poisons or the three unwholesome roots or the three fires. And then after you learn that, you go deeper and understand the 10 fetters. There's also antidotes to each of these poisonous states. If you're talking about them as poisons, we usually refer to them as antidotes to antidote the poison and get rid of it. If we're talking about them as the unwholesome roots, then we talk about the solutions being the wholesome roots. Or if we talk about them as the three fires, we will talk about extinguishing the fires because you need to extinguish these in the mind and clear these out of the mind in order to experience the brightness and the radiance and the joy of the enlightened mind. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first talk about each of the three from kind of a higher level. Then we're going to go into each one in detail so that you can understand them in detail. So craving anger and ignorance, it's masking your true nature, the true mind of the enlightened mind, the awakened mind that has wisdom and compassion. It motivates all non-virtuous or unskillful conduct, all decisions that you're making that are unwise. They're coming from these three poisons, but the mind is just unaware of this in the unenlightened state. So as you make decisions through these three poisons, you, you put those decisions out, then unwholesome results come back to you. So all your intentions, speech, and actions are going to emanate from these essentially as the mind is in the unenlightened state. But then more and more, what you're doing is you're arising the wholesome roots or the extinguishing these fires or antidoting these poisons. You're bringing more and more of the wholesomeness into the mind and purifying it of these poisonous states so that you can then experience the brightness and the radiance of the mind. The craving or oftentimes referred to as greed or desire or attachment. This is where the mind has certain selfish desires. The mind is grasping for contentedness and satisfaction outside of itself, thinking that some external thing is going to provide some lasting satisfaction. So the mind chases it and chases it and chases it. You maybe get a job and you're making $30,000 a year perhaps, and now you get really happy because you got this new job and you're making this money and you feel happy for a period of time, maybe three months or six months, but then all of a sudden the mind craves more. 
you're not happy with that anymore. You want maybe 50,000. And now you chase and chase and chase and chase and chase. And you eventually get to 50,000. You get happy for a period of time, but then that happiness fades. And now the mind's discontent again, and it's upset or it's frustrated and it wants more money. And now it wants more, 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 more. And it chases and chases and chases until it gets to 80 or 100 or whatever the mind is chasing after. It's the same thing with a house or a car or a friend or the number of friends that you have or the certain amount of clothes or investments. The mind just chases and chases and chases. It's almost like an unquenchable thirst that the mind thinks something outside of itself is going to provide some lasting satisfaction. So it keeps chasing and chasing and chasing. This is called craving or greed or desire. It's the longing, the yearning, the chasing after the objects of our affection, thinking that the next new shiny object waiting around the corner is going to provide some kind of lasting satisfaction. And because of our misunderstanding that this outside thing is going to provide some lasting satisfaction, we will chase it. And if we get what we want, we will get pleasant feelings like happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, exhilaration, euphoria. But if we don't get what we want in the unenlightened state, we will get painful feelings like sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, stress, anxiety. So this is what the mind's doing is it's essentially going up and down and up and down, chasing after certain desires that it has. And as I mentioned, if it doesn't get what it wants, it moves to this anger, this hatred, this ill will. This is where the mind falsely believes that the problem is outside of itself. So when you experience painful feelings like anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, or things like this, you will typically push people away out of your life, thinking that this is going to solve the problem, that the mind is falsely believing that this person or this situation is the problem. So you will push that person or that situation out of your life, but it doesn't solve the problem because you keep getting angry and frustrated about something else, or you will become bitter and harsh and hostile or aggressive with somebody. And now your speech and your actions will become bitter and harsh with animosity towards a person. And then they might choose to leave out of your life because of that bitterness and hostility. Or the third thing that will happen is that one will put their expectations on another person. When they put their expectations on this person, trying to control them to do things that you want them to do, the mind is falsely believing that this is going to solve the problem. That if I can just get this person to do things my way, then the problem solved. But the problem's not solved because all that's happening is your craving is getting fulfilled and you're getting those pleasant feelings. It's only a matter of time before you crave something else. So when there's craving in the mind, sometimes you're going to get what you want and you'll get pleasant feelings. Sometimes you're not going to get what you want and you're going to get painful feelings. And that's where the mind moves to this anger, animosity, bitterness, and hostility. And then the mind will either push someone away, become bitter and harsh and hostile, or put your expectations on someone and try to control them. And then the third poison is the ignorance, is the whole reason why this is occurring is that the mind is misunderstanding what's really truly happening. It has this unknowing of true reality, this delusion, this confusion, this misunderstanding, this misperception, false beliefs and opinions and views that are in the mind. The mind is falsely believing that this person is causing you to be angry or this situation is causing you to be annoyed when in reality, It's the actual mind itself that is causing these feelings and the mind just doesn't understand. So it's experiencing this confusion or delusion or misunderstanding. And it's once you understand what the real problem is that you can actually solve it until you're willing to confront and take responsibility for what the real problem is, then you'll never fix it. You'll just keep getting angry over and over and over again. So by you understanding the problem in the solution, then you can actually solve it. But if you don't understand what the problem is or you're not willing to confront the problem, then you'll keep falsely believing that somebody else is the problem. And then you will continue to get angry and frustrated and bitter and harsh with that person because they're not doing things the way you want. So by us now exploring each of these individually, you can understand what they are and I'll explain to you what the solutions are. 
So the first one is craving, greed, desire, attachment. This is the mind longing and yearning for things outside of yourself. This is the unquenchable thirst where the mind thinks that the objects that it's chasing is going to provide some kind of lasting satisfaction. Uh, the mind can sometimes be obsessive, chasing after the objects of its affection. It can be, uh, you know, really chasing and chasing and chasing. Again, the next shiny object waiting around the corner seems like it's going to provide the mind what it wants. So it'll chase it and chase it and chase it. And temporarily, it gets those pleasant feelings. It almost feels justified in its quest because it gets happy, excited for a period of time. A number of hours or days or weeks or maybe even months it feels really great that it chased after this thing and it got it and it felt wonderful but it doesn't realize later when those conditions change and now the mind ends up in the sadness anger frustration and other feelings it was because it was chasing after this object so let me give you an example if you are pursuing a new job for example we need, a, we need to have an occupation. We need to have some kind of livelihood to take care of ourselves. But oftentimes the mind is chasing, chasing, chasing rather than pursuing something as a goal, as an objective or an interest and gradually working towards it. The mind will tend to chase it and it thinks that, ah, this job is so perfect. This is the best job ever. I'm going to chase it, chase it, chase it, chase it. So the mind will do all these different activities to chase after this job. And then if it gets the job, it's like, wow, I got the job. Yes, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. And now it starts this new job. And you might feel great for a year or two or three or four or five. It might be the perfect job that you've always imagined to be the perfect job. And you got so excited with pleasant feelings when you first got the job. But then you don't realize three years later, five years later, when the company lays you off or they go out of business or whatever reason you lose the job, you feel sad, you feel angry, you feel frustrated. The reason why is because you had those conditioned feelings at the beginning when you first got the job, you got those pleasant feelings. And now those pleasant feelings were based on the condition that you have this job. And then when everything changed and now you don't have this job anymore, the mind experienced the sadness, the anger, the frustration. This job was not permanent. Because nothing in the world is permanent. Everything around us is impermanent. But the unenlightened mind doesn't understand the universal truth of impermanence. So the mind is craving for this job to be permanent. And then when it realizes that it's not permanent, the mind experiences the anger, the frustration, the irritation. It's the same thing that's occurring when somebody dies. Oftentimes we think grief is being caused by love. But that's not what causes the grief and sadness at the time of death. If your grandmother or grandfather, or your mom or dad dies, this isn't what's causing your grief. It's not the love. It's the craving, desire, attachment. It's the longing, the yearning. It's craving grandma to be permanent. It's longing and yearning for grandpa or, gra or mom or dad or brothers and sisters to be permanent. But they weren't permanent. They were born, so they had to die. But the unenlightened mind doesn't understand impermanence. It doesn't like change. It's craving, it's longing, it's yearning, it's wanting things to be permanent. And when it doesn't get the permanence, it then experiences discontent feelings that are very painful, like grief or sadness or despair or some other discontent feeling. And the same thing happens when we go to weddings. Some people, when their brother or sister get married, mom or dad or the children or the siblings will be grieving at a wedding because they're craving for this person to be permanent. And now when they're going off in the world as a couple with a new partner, this represents impermanence. So someone might grieve at a wedding. Same thing when a child goes off to college, sometimes parents can grieve Again, you know, this, this isn't because anybody's bad or has done anything wrong. It's just because the mind has this ignorance or this unknowing of true reality. And it's all coming from this craving. The mind is longing and yearning, wanting to keep their child permanently. But when they go away to college, this represents impermanence and the mind doesn't understand. It grieves. It may be sad. It may, the individual may cry and be upset. It's not the love. Love is a genuine interest in seeing this being be well, right? 
loving this being as they are. That's what love is. Love doesn't cause grief because love is this genuine interest in seeing others be well. What's causing the grief and the sadness and all these other discontent feelings is the craving, the desire, the longing, the holding on to things, the chasing after things. So there's solutions to this to solve this and eradicate the craving from the mind. But you need to know what they are in order to implement them. And then you need to gradually train the mind and gradually practice the teachings and then you'll see the gradual progress. The solutions are first, breathing mindfulness meditation. The meditation that we did this morning, <clears throat> this is helping you to be able to train your mind to let go. Because when your children or your brothers or sisters or your parents or whomever is leaving out of your life, or it's perceived that they're leaving, or maybe they're dying, your mind is holding on. You're wanting to hold them permanently. Or there's some situation at home or at work that your mind is holding on to and you've been chasing after this thing and you don't want to let it go. So the breathing mindfulness meditation is developing the awareness of mind and concentration so that you can be aware when the mind is longing and yearning and chasing after things. And then when you're aware that the mind is longing and yearning and chasing after things, you can then train the mind to let it go. Because if in meditation you've been training your mind to let go, let go, let go, let go, now in daily life, as you see your mind longing and yearning and chasing things, you can observe that with mindfulness or awareness of mind, and then you can internally cut that off and tell the mind, no, don't chase that. But this comes with training. It's not going to be it's just learning it one time and then immediately implementing it in your mind's fix. It took the Buddha six years to get to enlightenment. It's going to take some time to gradually train the mind. So sometimes we put pressure on ourselves to hurry up and be perfect today. But this is a gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress of implementing breathing mindfulness meditation into your life and gradually building up your practice where you're building these qualities of mindfulness, concentration, and the ability to easily let go through breathing mindfulness meditation. Then the other training that we use in order to train the mind to let go is generosity. By practicing generosity, you're giving and sharing more than it strictly required in any given situation without any expectation of anything in return sharing your time, your effort, your energy, and your resources. Because when the mind has craving, it tends to be very selfish and it holds on to things very tightly and it doesn't want to share. So by you sharing your time, your effort, your energy, and your resources with the people around you, it trains your mind to let go and not to just pursue selfish desires. Because that's what will happen with a mind that has craving. It will pursue selfish desires. But when you're learning generosity and you're practicing this quality of mind where you're giving and sharing without any expectation of anything in return, it helps to train the mind to not just chase after selfish desires, that there's this interconnectivity amongst all beings that we can give and share with others without any expectation of wanting anything from them. So these are the two primary trainings that we use in order to eliminate craving. And I'll just pause here and see if you guys have any questions on this particular topic. Yes, ma'am. Oh, <laughs> Sorry. Um, so specifically with regards to grieving, um, what is an appropriate and compassionate way to comfort someone who is grieving? Because mm. I feel like if we were to tell them, just let it go, is your attachment. It's not very appropriate at that mm. time. Mm -hmm. So what is your advice for helping someone to comfort them? Yeah, so... When somebody's grieving, they may not understand why they're grieving. They're going to think that it's love. And oftentimes we try to hold on uh, to the memories and to all the different things that we experience with this person that 
we think that if we let go, that we're letting go of the love because they think that that's what's causing the grief. So they feel like if they let go, they're going to let go of their love and they're not interested in doing that. But what it is, is it's craving, desire, attachment, masquerading as love. The person thinks that that's the love, but they're misunderstanding. That's the craving, desire, attachment, the mind holding on. So you can get to a point where you appreciate and have gratitude for someone who's lived and you've spent your time with them and you can love them while not grieving even though they've died because the only thing that's happened is impermanence all of us are going to die but the mind doesn't understand this in the unenlightened state so oftentimes when someone's grieving they're not understanding that it's the craving desire attachment that is causing their mind to be discontent they think it's the love so you've got to find a, a window of time where they're interested to understand they may not be interested to understand they may be grieving so deeply that anything you say to them could uh, their mind because of their craving is going to become more angry or more frustrated or more irritable so you should only share something with somebody about these teachings if they request it uh, giving unsolicited feedback or guidance or teachings is only going to uh, potentially arise the ego or arise discontentedness on their side. Um, so in this practice, we don't unsolicit, uh, we don't give unsolicited guidance. We only share teachings if somebody asks us. So if somebody was grieving around me, I would ask them, are you interested to understand why your mind is grieving? And if they say no, I would say, okay, I understand, right? If they say, yes, I am interested, then I would share with them. I would teach them about the universal truth of impermanence. I would teach them about the Four Noble Truths and the, the things that we taught yesterday and help them see and understand for themselves. So there's nothing you can do to make this person feel better because you're not causing their discontent feelings. What's causing their sadness and anger or frustration or whatever they're experiencing, their grief, is their craving, desire, attachment. And only they can choose to eliminate it. But they can only choose to eliminate it if they have wisdom. So the best thing, in my opinion, is just to let them know you understand and ask them if they would like help to understand why they're grieving. And if they say yes, then you can help them. If they say no, then you can't help them because their mind's not open to understanding. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Okay, so I'm going to move on here to the next one, which is the anger, hatred, and ill will. So with the craving, again, if the mind gets what it wants, it gets those pleasant feelings. Those are the happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, exhilaration, euphoria. But if the mind doesn't get what it wants, it moves to this anger, hatred, ill will, this frustration, irritation, annoyance. There's lesser versions. We tend to talk about it in the extreme, like anger, hatred, ill will. But there's lesser versions that are coming from this same poison, like the frustration, like the irritation, like the annoyance. Even if you just dislike somebody, maybe you look at somebody and you just dislike them based on the way they look, based on the way they talk. Maybe you're jealous of the certain material objects that they have and you just dislike them, right? This is the uh, coming from this same poison. What this is, is this is where the mind is essentially uh, uncomfortable with its own painful feelings. There's this animosity, this bitterness, this uh, hostility that is in the mind. And this is coming from its craving. If it wasn't for craving, anger wouldn't exist. That it's because the mind isn't getting what it wants that it then moves to this anger, hatred, and ill will, this aggression, this resentment, and this aversion. The mind is treating its inner feelings almost like an enemy. And even looking out in the world around you, potentially for enemies and trying to determine, you know, who are you going to like and who are you going to dislike? And now the mind is assigning that to the individual people around you. And this is all coming from craving. The mind's wanting things to be a certain way. And if you get things your way, you get the pleasant feelings. But if you don't get things your way, you get the anger the frustration, the annoyance, the dislike. So this is just going to continue to persist in the mind if you don't take action to fix it. So with loving kindness meditation, where you're cultivating in the mind on a regular basis, this genuine interest in seeing all beings be well, 
or having goodwill towards all beings, you can train your mind in meditation to be able to have this goodwill, this genuine interest in seeing others be well. This is the exact opposite of the bitterness and the hostility and the aggression that the mind has. So by training your mind in loving kindness meditation, it's like filling up the gas tank. And now you go out into the world through your intentions, your speech, and your actions, and you treat people loving and kind. And the Buddha provides guidance in the Eightfold Path of how to actually do that. We learned that yesterday as part of our course, where you learn things like right, excuse me, right intention, right speech and right action. He provides you guidance of having the intention of renunciation, the intention of non-ill will, the intention of harmlessness. He provides you guidance on speech and how to speak with a mind of loving kindness. And then in terms of our actions, ensuring that we're not causing harm to others through our actions. So when you train your mind in loving kindness meditation and you're developing this active goodwill without judgment, this genuine interest in seeing others be well, now when you're training that, that way in meditation on a consistent ongoing basis, you can go out into the world and be loving and kind. Right now, you might find it challenging to be loving and kind to certain people in your life or certain people that you meet along your journey. There might be a certain amount of resentment or bitterness that's in the mind. This is normal for the unenlightened mind. But by the time you get to enlightenment, you can wear away all that bitterness, all that resentment, because it's not hurting anybody other than yourself. You're hurting yourself with this uh, bitterness and hostility. But then when it comes through your intention, speech, and actions, it hurts others. And now that hurt comes back to you. That unwise decision to be bitter and harsh and hostile towards others through your intention, speech, and actions, it just comes back to you. If you're bitter and harsh with your life partner, with your children, with your coworkers, with your neighbors, that's all going to come back to you because people are going to treat you the same way that you treat them. So by training your mind in loving kindness meditation to gradually build up and cultivate and develop the mind to be more loving and kind, then it'll be easier to go out into the world and be loving and kind. But right now, it might be a certain challenge in certain situations, particularly if your relationships have craving, desire, attachment. If you have attachment to your parents or your siblings, for example, and you want them to be a certain way, when they're the way you want them to be, you'll be happy. But when they don't do things your way, you'll be angry or bitter or harsh towards them. And now this is putting strain on your relationships. But you can train your mind in loving kindness this meditation to be loving and kind to all beings, including those people that are close to you. And if you're using breathing mindfulness meditation to knock down the attachment, then with less craving and attachment in your relationships, now you'll find it easier to be more loving and kind. So while you're working on eliminating craving, desire, attachment through breathing mindfulness meditation and generosity, you can also be working with loving kindness meditation in order to train the mind to be more loving and kind in your meditation and then going out into the world and being loving and kind through your intentions, your speech, and your actions. Any questions on this particular poison or this unwholesome root or this fire? Okay, so let's go to the next one. This next one is the whole reason why craving and anger even exist. If it wasn't for this poison, craving and anger wouldn't even exist. So even though we call it craving, anger, and ignorance, it's really because of ignorance that craving and anger continues to exist. We use this word ignorance, and this is kind of like a derogatory word nowadays. A Buddha, an enlightened being, doesn't talk in derogatory and degrading ways to people. So here we're translating it as ignorance, but the phrase that I tend to like to use is the unknowing of true reality. I still use this word ignorance because some other teachers use it and it will help you if you study other resources and with other teachings. Uh, you'll see where it plugs in, but you should think about it as the unknowing of true reality or confusion or misunderstanding. Some people use the word delusion. Essentially, the unenlightened mind does not understand what it does not understand. It does not understand that craving is causing the problem. In the unenlightened state, we walk around firmly believing 
that other people are causing us to be angry. We firmly believe that other people are frustrating us and annoying us, or that music is annoying me, or that thing you're doing is annoying me, where we just don't understand what we don't understand. We haven't studied and we haven't seen the truth. We haven't seen clearly. Our mind is having confusion where we don't understand what we don't understand. We have this lack of wisdom. And because of this ignorance of things like the three universal truths, the four noble truths, the eightfold path, the five precepts, the natural law of gamma, meditation techniques, we misunderstand, we don't understand the three poisons. We don't understand so many aspects of how to train our own mind. We don't understand what's called the natural laws of existence. Essentially, an unenlightened mind is living in a world that it doesn't understand. And this is why when you watch the news, you might get frustrated or angry or irritated. Or if somebody does something, you might say, gosh, I don't understand why he does that. It's just making me so frustrated. The struggle, the difficulty that you're having is because of the ignorance, the unknowing of true reality, this lack of wisdom, the confusion, the misunderstanding. The Buddha taught what's called the natural laws of existence. These are the teachings that will help you to understand the natural laws around you and how the world is actually functioning. But as long as the mind doesn't understand these natural laws, you will struggle and you will have difficulties. You'll come to certain situations in your life and you will struggle with how to implement decisions that will produce a wholesome result. Because of a lack of wisdom, you will make unwise decisions that lead to unwholesome results. And each individual thing that you're experiencing in your life is a result of your decisions. So with a lack of wisdom, you'll naturally make unwise decisions that lead to unwholesome results. But when you transform this unknowing of true reality or this ignorance, you can transform it into wisdom. And when you develop wisdom, then you will make wise decisions that lead to wholesome results because you now have wisdom of the natural laws of existence. So this is why you don't believe the teachings of the Buddha because with belief, you don't know what's true or false. You'll continue to make unwise decisions because you don't have wisdom. With belief, you don't have wisdom. You don't know what's true or false. But when you learn teachings, when you reflect on them to independently verify them, and then you practice them, then you can get the wisdom because you can see the truth for yourself because you've independently verified what is being taught. And now with that wisdom of how the mind functions, how the world functions through these natural laws, now you will make wiser and wiser decisions that lead to wholesome results. But when you don't understand the natural laws, you'll continue to experience this unknowing of true reality or this lack of wisdom and make unwise decisions that lead to unwholesome results. And typically when we experience unwholesome results in the unenlightened state, once again, we will blame other people. We will look around to blame other people, not realizing the real true problem is inside your own mind. It's the craving, anger, and ignorance that is causing the unwholesome results in your mind. But because of the ego being in there, the arrogance and the pride, thinking that we're so great and we're so perfect, the unenlightened mind will tend to look for other people to blame. You know, you're the last person that your mind wants to admit that you've made an unwise decision. So the more you can develop your wisdom around the natural laws of existence, the more you can awaken to this wisdom, making wise decisions that will then lead to wholesome results. And you did exactly the same thing with other natural laws in your life. When we were first born, we didn't understand the natural law of gravity. And because we didn't understand the natural law of gravity, we made unwise decisions that led to unwholesome results. We fell down, we hit our knee, we busted our elbow, we hit our head, we knocked over glasses of water and broke things. We fell off our bicycle, we tripped and fell because we didn't understand the natural law of gravity. So we made unwise decisions that led to unwholesome results. But slowly but surely, we gained wisdom of this natural law of gravity. And by the time we were about 10 or 12, we had fully awoke. We had full wisdom of the natural law of gravity. We learned to tie our shoes. We learned to look at the surface that we were walking on. We learned to not jump up and down and be so uh, giddy all the time. Uh, we learned to be very, you know, much more calm and steady to the point where we could ride a bicycle. We could 
ride a motorcycle, we could climb ladders, we can get on airplanes and travel all over the world. So we awoke to the wisdom of the natural law of gravity. So now we make wise decisions and we only experience wholesome results typically around the natural law of gravity, right? And occasionally we might trip and fall or do something here or there, but by and large, we make wise decisions because we fully awoke to the wisdom of the natural law of gravity. So we struggled when we were a child because we didn't have the wisdom of the natural law of gravity. We had difficulties. So the unenlightened mind is doing exactly the same thing with all these natural laws that the Buddha taught is the mind is struggling and having difficulties because it's unawakened to the wisdom of these natural laws. And the more you gain wisdom and transform this ignorance into wisdom by not believing any teachings, but learning, reflecting to independently verify and practice, that's where you can awaken the mind. And now life can be ease. You can be at ease. You can be comfortable. You can be able to make wise decisions and you can function in the world through these natural laws. It's kind of like upgrading your operating system of the mind, moving to this enlightened mental state. In the unenlightened mind, it's like being on unenlightened version 1.0 and you're on this old operating system and now it's very cumbersome it's a struggle it's difficult there isn't support for it anymore you know it's kind of like technical support is no longer supporting this old version of software and then what you do is you incrementally upgrade your operating system in the mind and as you're upgrading your operating system just like on a computer the first couple of weeks as you're working on that new operating system on the computer, it's quite challenging. It's a little bit of a struggle. It's kind of difficult. And you might even think that it's not as good as the old operating system. But then the more you use that new operating system, you start realizing, wow, that does work better. Wow, I like how they rearrange this and they put this over here and they put that over there. Slowly but surely, as you use this new operating system on the computer, you realize that it actually functions a lot better. You just had to develop your skills and your ability to use this new operating system. And now it's actually much more efficient. The un unenlightened mind is essentially the same thing. It's on this old operating system. And as you're upgrading the operating system with these teachings, it can be a little bit of a challenge. It can be a, a struggle in certain situations. But after you overcome that and you get up and running on enlightened mind 9.0, now when you're on this new operating system of the enlightened mind, it's not difficult anymore. Life is at ease because now you've got wisdom of this operating system. You've got wisdom of these natural laws of existence. So this is the ignorance or the unknowing of true reality. And the antidote is wisdom. So the antidotes here or the um, wholesome roots are generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom. That's what's going to antidote the craving, anger, and ignorance. This is the exact opposites of the craving, anger, and ignorance, the generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom. So as long as these three poisons or three unwholesome roots or three fires are in the mind, the mind's going to continue to struggle and have difficulties because the mind's operating through these poisons or unwholesome roots or these uh, defilements or these pollutions. Every being who's born is unenlightened. Right? So you don't need to feel guilty or shameful that your mind is experiencing anger and sadness and frustration in others. You haven't done anything wrong necessarily. But once you understand that the mind is having these challenges and these struggles, then you can choose to go forward and learn and develop your practice to now transform the mind. So there's all types of programs that you can participate in. There's online programs, there's in-person courses and retreats and all these different things that you're welcome to participate in and uh, learn. And it's all available for you at no cost. All the books, all the classes, courses, retreats, all the videos and podcasts and even personal guidance. You can sit down with a teacher and we help you to understand the teachings and apply them specifically to your life. Whether you're here in Chiang Mai or no matter where you are in the world, you can meet one-on-one -on -one and we will help you. As you attend classes and courses, retreats, read the books, you can gradually learn, you can gradually practice, and you can gradually progress where you see your mind becoming more and more peaceful. And each individual just needs to decide that they're done with anger. They're done with sadness. They're tired of grieving. They're, they're uh, you know, giving up on the despair. These feelings are optional. 
we tend to think in the human state that these feelings are required and that we're required to feel this way, but they're optional. You can opt out of feeling sad. You can heal from what hurts you so that you never need to hurt again. But it's an individual's choice of whether or not they're going to do that or not. So these are the three poisons or the three unwholesome roots or the three fires. I'll open up to whatever questions you guys have. Uh, those of you guys online, you can put it into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can electronically raise your hand in Zoom. And those of you guys here, we have the microphones you guys are welcome to use. Okay. Let's see. Okay, I guess you guys must be understanding to a certain point. So this is the end of our discussion on the three poisons or the three unwholesome roots or the three fires. We usually take a break here. It's basically 1030. And for those of you guys that were just here for the morning, this might be all that you're interested in learning or maybe even more than you were interested in learning. You're welcome to stick around if you like. After our break, we're going to be studying what's called the five precepts using the words of the Buddha. These are five decisions that an individual makes that can be very impactful and very difficult, causing harm in the world and then harm can come back to you. So we're going to use the original words of the Buddha in order to understand what he taught around the five precepts. Some people think that the Buddha taught no killing, no stealing, no sexual misconduct, no lying, no intoxicants. He actually didn't teach that. Those sound like rules. It sounds like black and white. The Buddha doesn't, didn't teach that way. Uh, he doesn't explain it that way. So when you see his words, then you'll actually understand what he taught on this topic. And we're going to be teaching that after our break. For those of you guys online, we're not going to be live streaming that part of our class, but thank you for joining. And we'll see you guys perhaps in a future class. We're going to come back from break at um, 11, I'm sorry, at uh, 1045. That'll give us a 15 minute break. So enjoy your break. And if I see you afterwards, wonderful. If not, perhaps I'll see you in a future class. And have a lovely rest of your day. Sawadikha. Thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much.